Hey, Todd. Please, I am, I am very sorry. I think I moved homes. Too many things going on. So it's been a little bit. Okay, no, thank you very much, Carla. It's wonderful that you're here. I'm glad that you came a little bit late because it gave me a chance to look deeper. Do you know that you've got 27,000 Facebook followers, 47,000 Twitter followers, 70,000 Instagram? Your name comes up 700 times on Google search when I use the quotes, and you've got 10,000 videos attributed to your name. I looked through the videos, at least the first 10 pages, which is 100 videos, they're all you. So I don't know what's after that. <laughs> um, but your, 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 walk, your walk has been fa fantastic for Syria. This whole channel is about truth seekers path. Carla, you are a fantastic truth seeker. And uh, you're an actress, a tennis player. You've uh, made, made, you graduated to making your own films. I've seen um, uh, parts of them, seen the interviews you've done. It's really great what you're doing because you're, people are tired of reporters. People are tired of the news. Uh, you're a real person, and you're, you're uh, have you, I guess I want to get to know your walk. How has your walk, how did you find your walk? Have you found some sacrifices? That, uh, are you happy that you're, you're on this? Obviously, you are. What, are. what are the challenges that you had? How did you wake up? So many questions I have that other people will be interested because my followers are just looking at the mess of the of the planet and when someone like you comes out it's unusual it's first quite... of all thank you I have, I have no idea we're directly live uh, so I apologize for for the time and thank you so much for uh, for all your your followers and the people that are watching us right now and especially for you to give me this space and, and to give this space like you say through seekers on the end, you know, I believe that um, once you see the truth, uh, you must do something about it. You cannot not do anything about it. Um, you made me many questions, so I don't know where you want me to start. You want me to start with Syria? You want to start with my life? Um, what What is the thing that that uh, that you would like to me to to start with? <laughs> Okay, so I guess let's start with what you're currently doing with Syria. Could you update us on what you're doing at the moment with uh, your activism? Yes, uh, well, I came back a month and a half ago from my last trip in Syria. Um, I've done a, a basically a little bit over uh, 10 trips to Syria. I've been using uh, Beirut as my base in the past uh, two years. I started this project two and a half years ago. Um, it's been a, a very important call uh, for my soul. In reality, this was, I, I didn't know anything about Syria. I have to be very honest that uh, um, to me, it was just one of the many conflicts in the Middle East, unsolved problems that is too much to get involved with and uh, too bad for the people because uh, they are under the rule of a horrible dictator like in many places and uh, that was all I knew about it and uh, it, Syria came um, in a very beautiful way because um, it, it was almost a spiritual call uh, that I didn't want to take and uh, everything uh, was facing and aiming me to pay attention to the country so I did uh, my first trip in February uh, 2016. I thought it was going to be a 15-day trip and that turned into two years. Um, I decided to make a documentary. It's called The Voice of Syria. I thought that the documentary was finished in July 2016 after three trips I made and then I decided to go a little bit more into the rebel held area into Syria uh, where I had um, a really bad experiences um, because unfortunately in the rebel held areas in Syria um, the, the presence of uh, extremism, terrorism uh, as well as a very extreme Islamist groups um, are everywhere, they dominate the areas um, so I, I suffer what most civilians in, in Syria, in, in the rebel held area suffer so at my return I wanted to go back to Aleppo but on the, on the other side, on the government area, because I wanted to compare East Aleppo to the other side um, uh, of Aleppo. 
Uh, they told me it wasn't secure. So I kept on going later into uh, France and England and uh, Germany and uh, try to speak with refugees, Syrian refugees, to understand a little bit better because there were too many different stories that one did not go with the other and the narrative that we hear in our media and what I knew had nothing to do to what Syrians were telling me inside of Syria, even in rebel-held areas. Um, so then after finally I got permission and uh, to go into East Aleppo, uh, sorry, into Aleppo, uh, and it just happened to be in December where I spent close to 25 days when it was the actual liberation of the big battle of Aleppo. And then that took me um, into going back 2017 much more. So I thought in February 2017, I was finished with the film. Then in July, I thought after a trip, I was finished with the film. Palmira was liberated. Palmira was retaken. Um, and then the advancement, advancement started going on. The resort was liberated. And then the huge problem of Duma and Guta happened. And to me, it didn't make much sense because um, when I was in Aleppo, I was seeing one story, uh, my parents were seeing one story in the news and I was in Aleppo and I saw what was going on. So I decided to go into Duma and Guta, exactly the same story. Everything was a lie of what we were watching in our news. There was no chemical attack. I. I uh, we can talk in detail about my last trip in, in Guta and Duma, but I visited seven cities inside of Guta. I was in Duma, I was in Samalka, where the first uh, alleged chemical attack uh, blamed to the government happened. And I basically focused myself on this. I visited the headquarters of um, uh, the White Helmets, which are basically spokespeople uh, in the United States because we and in the United Nations in all the West because we receive all the news from them. And that's kind of like the work that I've been doing. So I ended up getting involved with governments. I ended up getting involved with congressmen, with a lot of NGOs, uh, giving uh, talks to universities, um, a lot of politicians, even presidents, prime ministers about Syria and what is really going on on the ground, showing my footage. Um, and, you know, it just and growing. And um, whether I have some official uh, appointments, uh, whether it's the uh, Human Rights Commission or the United Nations or still, you know, my work is very personal and I self-found myself. I am doing this with my production company. Um, because it's the only way to keep control of all this. So that just to give the whole, and now you can ask me whatever you want. <laughs> wow. that, that is an incredible story, Carla. Thank you so much. That's so much activities that you're currently involved with. You're, you're in a different world than you were since before you had this spiritual wake up. Since this is the truth seekers path, what I'd like to get is truth seekers have a story. You had a wake up. Was that spiritual calling a, your your sort of tr biggest transition in your life from understanding, well, the world is run differently than I was raised to believe, than my parents believed, than my friends believed, than Hollywood, uh, Bolivia. It, the world is given this uh, idea of what's going on, and specifically today about the Syrian war, but so many other subjects come up as well. What would, could you describe that spiritual calling and um, and, and I'd like to inspire other people to follow their spiritual calling. So many people ignore it, and, and they ignore this, um, this gift of, of life that you've achieved for yourself and for other people to see. Look, I was a tennis player, and with tennis, I studied acting because my parents didn't want me, obviously, to be an actress. Uh, and I started my career when I was 15 years old. I've been in Mexico, in Venezuela. I worked in Miami, in Colombia, in Spain, in the United States. I've done TV series, soap operas, movies. Um, I was uh, to really taste uh, the flavor of not just being a celebrity, but being a somehow a almost tastemaker, how they say, where you actually influence people or how you dress and what you do, how you do, how you have to do things. I work very tirelessly uh, with um, 
uh, the environment uh, for everything that is renewable energy with the United Nations. And at the same time, I work with indigenous and children in my, my home back home in Bolivia. Uh, uh, we built uh, many things for the indigenous in the Altiplano, which is where people have to walk for hours uh, to just get some water. Uh, we created with my brothers a nonprofit organization for homeless children and children in jail. Uh, so my uh, activism in a way uh, of social consciousness was always there. But uh, I made a film in 2015 that was about Operation Condor, which was an uh, operation that was overseen by the CIA in order to overthrow the democratically elected government in South America um, in order to stop the growth of, uh, of communism uh, and socialism during uh, the Cold War. This movie, it was my first film as a producer. So it kind of put me on the spot in a very a strong way politically. And I got sort of like the respect of filmmakers uh, onto these very serious subjects, as well as getting an award from the Congress of the United States, even though I was criticizing the actions of the CIA. And then later they said, yes, we're sorry, we did all this after, you know, um, tens of thousands of disappeared people and killed people. I remember in one talk I said, you know, right now there's so many wars in the Middle East. I hope one day we're not gonna hear about Operation Middle East. This was in 2015, like this was Operation Condor. But what happened to me, um, Todd, is that I had, I had a dream, right? Uh, that I had to pay attention to this. When I start looking at the news, I start seeing that all the news that we had from Syria or from Iraq or from uh, in North Korea, they come from refugees or people that are living in our countries. So why don't we have a, the testimony of people living in the countries that are actually leaving these wars, that are suffering, that are losing their children, that are losing their homes. Why don't, why aren't we interested in going and talking to them? Why are we leaving the lobbies and the lobbyists that are, you know, in our governments? And we know we in the West are, have many beautiful positive things, but at the same time, we are empires, we are powers, we are uh, powerful nations that will always seek our own interests to stay powerful. And why do we, why will we believe only what these lobbyists are saying? Uh, are, do they really have the best interests of the people of Syria, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan? No, the question, the answer of course is no. So when, when I started having this this dream and then you know i was ordering every time they're sending me a, a driver to pick me up for an interview or to take me to a place the guy was syrian he started talking about syria this uh, wonderful journalist uh, saw my film about operation condor and called me and uh, all of a sudden i start seeing i've never in my life heard anything about syria and all of a sudden everybody around me was syrian and when you say the spiritual call, sometimes we need to pay attention, you know? There's this beautiful saying that it's it's not that we are depressed, it, it is that we are distracted. We're so distracted that we don't realize that our spiritual life, our emotional life, our physical life must be in, in, in balance in order for us to really reach happiness. And if we can really do anything with our power, with what we have, whether you are a celebrity or you are not a celebrity, um, what can you do in your power? Sometimes we think, okay, I'm going to share something in my media, and I'm, um, but I have two likes. I didn't get to anyone. It is not true. Any share, any time we speak about the truth, the truth comes out. And in reality, this is the work of all of us. And this is our, this is, the, the level of consciousness that we need to realize we need to reach right now because we are at this level. We can't continue to live in a country that, uh, sorry, in a world that is not sustainable for everyone because ultimately, you know, um, 
if your if your finger is bleeding your whole body feels the pain and it doesn't matter how long we ignore these problems we are seeing it now with syria yeah syria seven years of war but it only became huge once the refugees became a world crisis so now we're feeling the pain in our body oh wait a second so we need to do something about solving this problem so i'm sorry about the long response but awakening to our our call we all have we watch a little video and we feel like impotent it's like what am i going to do what can i do i can do anything and that's the aim that we see the news and they make us feel um worthless that there's nothing you can do that you can't solve it and it's not true the number one step to waking up is that we you each of us have the actual power to do something to change the world thank you for that message and please don't apologize carla this is your floor we're honoring you as the truth seeker you've done so much so you've got the floor i'll just try to prompt you along along the way let's go with that you've got a spiritual calling you're already socially conscious and you are awakened well to another level let's say by a dream and the dream is accompanied by some real situations some people call that dream yoga there's a there's a, a a thought that says the dream is a symbol of life and life is also throwing symbols at us and if we're walking honestly in our path in communication with that higher intelligence we actually receive a lot more of these indicators and and we're guided along the path it seems to me you've been guided right into syria you've you've been you 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 had a mind um accepting the truth presented by the lies presented by the media that was your truth to some degree about me syria you went to syria you learned the truth because you talked with people on the ground oh who would think that you should do that with all these countries going to war we don't l listen to the people who are on the ground in the country so you did that and now you come back and you're talking to the united nations you're talking to all sorts of people from every different level of society do people listen to you? How has your life changed? Have you have you found effect of yourself effective in in this communication? Uh, yes, actually, uh, what is beautiful um, in this world is that there are many politicians that actually want to do do the right thing in every government and what is crazy is that there are actually politicians in all these powerful countries that truly do not know the truth that they don't know what really is going on because our agencies have been lying to our decision makers in order to manipulate the result on what needs to be done in order for our policies to be um basically enhance or or benefit benefit um so it, it's been a very beautiful journey because i was surprised to talk to many uh congressmen in different places and even mps that they actually truly know what's going on and they've been fighting this battle in their congress in their parliament talking about this but it's very frustrating that after i have a meeting and the guy tells me wait a second so so this is how it goes right so we are actually supporting terrorists so our our weapons end up in hands of the terrorists right i've been saying this in the parliament i've been saying this and i fight and they fight me and they tell me that i am pro assad and i tell them yeah you're right look at this and i show them that the, the, but then they go into their with their paper to to present this but then they give a public um interview and they say yes we are here and we support a, a, a military action against syria what you, you just told me something else i just we just had a meeting with all of your your your, your staff and it, it is sometimes very frustrating but i know the truth is there and i know that it does have effects we've been working with a lot of groups in order to try and remove some of the sanctions when i was in duma and in Guta, I had direct access to send them proof of the white helmets um, 
and uh, you know about what was really going on there uh, with many people that were in power and i was putting everything on my live videos this is the reason why i do the live videos as well and you know some people might think she's crazy uh, because yes i was taken from my bubble world my perfect world my barbie world you know uh from living in los angeles attending all these amazing parties red carpets and all this beautiful life where i was still thinking i'm helping and doing things to help my country and others uh, in order to go and see a reality in the world where uh they come and affect people to wake up to the actual truth and um, in the United Nations, I think uh, a lot of people, as you were saying that you were looking at one of my interviews with Dr. Jafari uh, from Al Jafari, sorry, from uh, Syria. And he says, even him, he gives a speech, he gives a talk. Nobody supports him while he gives a talk in the Security Council. He leaves the Security Council and, and the ambassadors come and tell him, we know it is the truth. Uh, I'm sorry, we so, we're sorry we could not support you. And this happens to me too. I was with a very, very high brigadier, very high, uh, that was in charge of uh, some of the actions even in Libya. And he asked me for a pri private meeting with me when we were in a summit uh, for human rights. And he asked me, he said, um, I was in Libya and I saw, and I informed NATO that this was a big mistake that we should have never go in and get Gaddafi because when I was there, I actually saw people that people like Gaddafi. How is it in Syria? Is it, do people support Assad? Are there people, are there anybody that like him? And I just nod my head and he said, I knew it. And the problem is that many of us know but we're being a stand buyers. And that is the biggest crime. We can't keep on being a sin buyers. Well said. Uh, Carla, you are very brave. Uh, you probably hear that word a lot. I don't want to say it in just a simple way. You've put your life actually at stake. You must have felt unsafe at times uh, dealing with white helmets. They're, they're absolutely not the kind of, my, my viewers know what kind of people make up white helmets. It's not the, not the people that are looking for weapons of mass destruction for uh, for, for uh, against um, against Syrians uh, used by Assad. If anything, it's them using those weapons and doing a lot of the terror that you talked about with the diplomat from Syria, Jafari. Um, you put your life at great risk, uh, Carla. You came out with some, you're a gem of a person to follow your path, first of all. You put your life at risk, you came back with great stuff, and uh, it's hard to communicate with some people, but you, you have to believe you're making an effect. Uh, Salute to you for the fight and for the effort. I, 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 what do you have to say about, uh, I mean, that's probably not for everyone. Have you felt, could you describe a story about feeling unsafe or how it was to be with Syrians in these bombed out zones that you have so many videos about? Oh my God. Uh, look, first, thank you for your words, but I know, I know this for sure, that any human being that will go into Syria and we've seen this, anybody that's gone to Syria, spokespeople uh, for Syria for, for ending the war, when you see the faces of these children, when you see the faces of these women and these men, and they have no hatred, they have no hate, they have no anger, they just want the war to end. They're the most humble, loving, welcoming people just, you know, and I, I, I try and I don't, believe it or not, I don't give many interviews because I am so deeply in love with this nation um, that I, I, I am so um, invested, personally invested completely with every piece of myself because yes, I was under so much danger so many times, but it was the people the ones that protected me. They were the people, the ones that helped me when we could not cross a checkpoint and there were shellings or there were, you know, bombings. A, house, a, a family that were 15 living in this house opened their door of me to me and seven people in my team for us to sleep there. And they gave us all the food they had and gave us coffee and, and gave us so much love. And, you know, it is so hard because 
you become like family in hours while the shelling is happening and then you cross you go into the, the very dangerous place you are in the front like you come back and this family is no longer there no they've been killed it's very difficult oh my God. yeah that's horrible so sorry that's why i i it's very hard for me to talk and you say you know they gave me everything and you feel you you know you have to do as much as you can you have to fight as much as you can and you say who are they to risk their lives for a foreigner and what i wouldn't also risk my life for them and it's such a beautiful journey and path because you you feel such a different sense of of importance of your existence of breathing of understanding that if you're in in the middle of terrorist attack and you made it through the day you wake up and the following day you're actually breathing you're actually alive what are you going to do with it and this is what syrians have learned it is the resilience to keep on going every day to not give up to continue going and they make you cry with every story because nothing will destroy their soul and this is the reason why they have won this war you know that we are in in the, in the two days where the south is being liberated where terrorism is basically completely expelled of syria and this is not just the victory of the syrian army but this is the victory of the people of syria their resilience, their resistance to not having hate, not getting into desperation. You know what it is to be in the house of a man whose wife was killed in front of him, his two children were raped in front of him and then killed, and his house was burned, and he has the strength to tell you, he has the strength to tell you in your face, don't worry. Don't cry because he's telling me the story and I'm crying, of course. And he tells me, we're going to raise like the Phoenix. We're going to be okay. And with these stones, we're going to rebuild a better Syria. And you look at them and you want to slap at them. You want to hug them. You want to kiss them. And you go like, why are we destroying this nation? Why are we helping by standing quiet to destroy this nation? Why are we, by selling weapons, destroying this nation. Why? With our policies, because it's convenient to this ally or to that ally destroying this country. So yes, of course, I'm going to risk my life a thousand more times for these people because they deserve, they deserve to have peace as much as you and I deserve to have peace. And it is our duty, you know, to fight for, for human dignity and to fight for showing, you know, that we are no longer warmongers, that we are people of peace, that we deserve to be happy. I'm so sorry, it's just that it's crazy, you know, you see it's already 700,000 people dead in this country. Yeah. And, uh, and it's only, this is only Syria. Iraq yeah. is a million. Yemen is happening. I mean, how many more people has to die? Yeah. And the, the most vulnerable are children. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, there are people making a lot of money on these wars, and I have a sneaky suspicion that that money incentive is influencing a lot of people um, to make decisions that they normally wouldn't make. And it's people like you that, uh, and, and um, to a very small degree, people like me and uh, others uh, that are that are getting the word out, but people like you have been there. Your story reminds me of one guy I interviewed, and you're right, everyone who goes to Syria, everyone, they come back with the same story because they've eyewitnessed the, the people on the ground, the culture, the diversity, the women uh, are treated quite well. Uh, they, they live freely, not like under U.S. ISIS control. I say U.S. ISIS because it's it's the same zones that they control. Uh, the rebel rebels are basically the, the the terrorists, which are funded, and most of them are foreign. We've we've established all that. We know that because people there see that. Do you have evidence of? Oh, I guess we could go on, on and on. I don't want to. Uh, 
I guess uh, this, this is about honoring you. Thank you very much, uh, Carla, for, for this. How much time do you have left in this? Do you have any time to talk about um, the, your opinion of different people's wake up category? So in Bolivia, are people mostly getting it when you talk to them? In the US, are people mostly not getting it as with me? Because I'm a, you can hear my accent, I'm li living in New Zealand. But when I still, when I talk with Americans, well, it's better than it used to be, that's all I can say. How about your experience of talking but yeah, so so uh, I, well right now I, I'm good, I'm good with time I'm sorry I was late so I'm I'm, I'm okay with time we have uh, 30 more minutes um, and uh, but we can cut whenever we we need to cut you know uh, the I think everybody is getting it once they see when they start seeing people get it the problem is that to fight seven years of propaganda it is very difficult to try and convince uh, you know, the world that what you've heard is not true. I mean, look at me. I went there 10 times and I would go again and ask again. I was thinking it was propaganda. I was like, there's no way there are people that like Assad. Why would they like him? If he is like, you know, gassing them, if he's poisoning them, if he's killing them, why would, they, why would there be so many people? So then I was going, to the sides of opposition i was going here I was going there the point is this and this is i think the most important gift i can have to your people the truth has many faces and depending where you're standing in the truth you're going to see one thing or the other but there is one dominated truth that is the one that will always hold the people that are leaving the problem so if you are neighbor uh, screams from the next door you have one truth and that doesn't mean that it's a lie it is your truth but the point of listening to the people inside of syria is that of course they have conflicts of course you're talking about a country that's been uh, um, uh, for 40 something years in power of course there's a lot of corruption of course syrian people do not um agree with many things of of the government but they support their president 100 percent and they support 100 percent their army the army of syria is not the army that started this this war um seven years ago almost eight years ago the syrian army today are the young people of syria that are volunteering and are being drafted and nobody in the world gets trained in three weeks to go fight isis and fight terrorism so you are talking about real human beings i saw with my eyes in the front line in aleppo even in in guta when it was on the last uh, places of babila and when i was also in the uh, well in the different cities how a Syrian soldier, whether he's a man or she's a woman, she drops her weapons on the floor and talks to the to the rebel that is holding the weapon, saying, "You're my brother. Don't fight me. Please let the civilian cross. Let her come, and then you and I open fire. Let her go." I saw it. I have it in my camera. So when somebody tells me, "Oh, the Syrian army," what is is this a sad army what a sad army this is the people of syria trying to fight for a secular syria an inclusive syria where the rights of women will stay and will the rights of minorities especially christians as you mentioned before will remain and especially and the most important thing is that there won't be any terrorism that there won't be any more uh, extremism in the land. This is the most important thing that people need to understand. But then, you know, the fight, the biggest fight that we have, it is really not in there at all. The biggest fight is in here. When you say, when you, when you tell me all these things, like the government over here listens, he wants to do something right, and then the opposition of this government in the United States is trying to stop it just because of their personal issues. And we are like, what is the big problem of talking of the president of the United States talking with the president, the president of Russia, 
who is an ally of the Syrian government in order to seek peace in Syria. What is the big problem? What are the differences, whether I'm a Republican or I am a Democrat, why can I put my mind into what is the very best for the country? Same in, in Australia, in New Zealand, in France, like, you know, uh, it, putting so much money into this. Like, why is it that the government of, of, of England got so upset with Trump when he stopped founding for, uh, for the White Helmets? Why is she call an emergency and publicly saying, you need to keep on doing it. If he doesn't, we will step in. Why is everybody so desperate when we try to resolve a war? And this, this point again, and I want to say, we're only talking about Syria. We've already done it in, and it's too late in Iraq and in Afghanistan and in Libya. We're talking, and we are on time to do this. And just resuming on this one, one thing when you were saying about fear, I am at more danger in the United States than I am in Syria, when I am in Syria. You were mentioning my followers, and this is the first time I'm going to speak about it uh, in, in, uh, outside. When I arrived into Syria, I had 150,000 followers on my Twitter. Until two weeks ago, um, before I started talking about Palestine, I used to have 77,000. And all of a sudden, when he, within two weeks, like everybody starts sending me messages on Twitter saying, why did you block me? Why are you blocking me? Why are you blocking me? Why are you disconnecting me? It, my, my Facebook was 150,000 saying, now we are at 100. My, my, my Instagram, I had 120,000. Everything keeps on dropping. When I wrote to Twitter, they said that my, my account was hacked. So, okay, I want to believe that my account was hacked, but it just happened when I spoke about Syria, it started dropping. When I spoke about Yemen, it kept on dropping. But the moment I touched Palestine, completely, I have to disappear and I couldn't even access my account. I couldn't even send that tweet. If you see, I've been not active for almost like three weeks or four weeks. So the attack comes from everywhere in order for you to be quiet because I am a public now. I don't have 160,000 followers and I have 50,000. Oh my God, this is so embarrassing. Okay, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to lose it all. No, this is how they manipulate us. This is how they they play with one thing or the other thing. Or they, they shadow block you, you know, where you are shadow banned. So nobody can see what you're showing. So that's why the truth seekers, the people that know the truth, we need to share. We need to talk about it. So... I just wanted to wrap this, all these like questions that you just did to me. And yes, I have a lot of evidence. I don't know um, what would you like to focus on the white helmets. I think, uh, and now I know almost everything about them. <laughs> yes, I think my, most of my readers know a lot about, uh, the listeners know a lot about the white helmets, but this is quite new. 150,000 uh, followers on Twitter reduced, now it's 47. I was putting 47 like I thought it was a big amount. Well, I still do think it's a big amount, but going down to that level, one third. I want to show you, this is what happened last week. And this is actually very funny. This is last week. And this is how much it said. Right. It was at 41. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can see from 95, 41, 70, uh, you the problem you know over here is that the only way we can co communicate our truth is through our soul it's our number one weapon is the only weapon we have for truth and for peace and I there's people will attack us who is going to attack us i don't know but you know like syrian says i don't care but we need to be victorious we need to succeed we need we need to keep on talking we cannot be afraid because on the end we're talking about the truth and the, the thing about, you know, the white helmets, I think the most sad thing about the white helmets is that they, 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 white helmets themselves are victims of terrorism. So it is really important to understand that the white helmets are not terrorists. They work for terrorist organizations. So what they do is like civilians will go and they would volunteer because they think they're going to go and save people.
to a, the civil defense that they're going to be able because by the way they do save people but they save militants they save terrorists they save fighters they ha they only save people that carry weapons they don't help civilians that is the it's not true but it is a lie to say that they don't save people now the next then the next thing is the fact that they go they volunteer and they they find out what they have to do they find out they are supposed to make these films that are fake that they are supposed to only save families and then in duma and in guta in in babila in samalka they were forced to leave to Italy. Many of them, they did not want to go. And I also spoke with some people extra officially. They won't give you an interview in front of the camera. And they're among the civilians. And they decided to stay there quiet and try to escape because they were forced to go into Italy with their whole families. So then themselves are being victims, the Syrian ones, because all of this is led and orchestrated by foreigners, that they're not even serious. Right, very sad story. You've broken a few things there. I liked how you ended that, um, Carla. You you said that uh, who are we're the path of the truth seeker and uh, who are our enemies going to be? I don't know and I don't care, but we're going to fight them, something like that, just like Syrians. The, thought that's, that's wonderful. I'll get the exact quote, what you said. I thought it was very well put. Uh, how do we lighten up this mood a little bit? This is so heavy and you broke so many important stories. Uh, I don't want to just leave it all heavy because we feel enough of that. And you, you said the word frustration. You come with the truth and it's so obvious to you and you present it and many frustrations along the way. But there are little victories that happen as well. What are some of the yes. touching things, surprising things, beautiful things? Um, that you could talk about with the children, with the women, with the old people, with uh, the generosity, um, anything that you saw that other people like me who've never been to Syria, what would we? What, what story would be surprising that's not so horrific maybe, something you, you met along the way? Can you think of a few of those kind of stories? Oh my God, you know what is the beautiful thing, Todd, that you have one sad story and you have 30 amazing stories um, because it's, um, I had a meeting with the advisor to one. It, it was probably one of my first and only official meetings because she's a, a very important lady. And she was explaining to me, you know, you're talking about a country that precedes 10,000 years to civilization. They've been living in this land, in this earth for 10,000 years, the Syrians. So the number one thing they have is they have an extreme knowledge about culture and about a about understanding the respect of mother earth you know they call to mother earth um ashtar mother ashtar and they think of syria as a mother this is one of the most beautiful um things that you were hear here and that makes you fall in love with them because they said but she's your mother she's my mother she's my lover she's my life and they refer to syria as a female but a mother breathing being and that she's suffering and i asked this palestinian man who had a um um a, a canadian um passport and i asked him um and his wife is canadian and i asked him and i said why don't you leave and he said if you would see your mother crucified like jesus would you leave her my mother syria is being crucified and I'm not going to watch her die. I'm going to have her until her last breath because we're going to be victorious. Things like these, they speak in poetry. You're walking and you don't have enough time because everybody offers you a cup of coffee. Everyone gives you a cup of coffee. Um, we were in the middle of destruction, in the middle of all the rubble. And there's this kid, you know, they always send their kids. It's like, hello, hello. And they don't have you know shoes and they come just like my, my father and my mother want to invite you to have coffee in the house and then you go they don't have windows they don't have um roof and uh, they, they they welcome you in their home and they open everything all their food that they have uh one um 
of the beautiful stories that I had actually this, this time was that I met this girl uh, last year when I was doing a Twitter live video uh, and uh, she invited me to her house. Her house didn't have her doors. And when I was uh, in, uh, in um, this time in Buta, she sends me a message saying, you know, my house now is completely revealed. And I made a live video. And uh, when I arrived to her house and she's still in the middle of all the rubble, but you could not believe your eyes, her excitement of having her house rebuilt and how people go back in the middle of the rubble and they're already rebuilding everything. Aleppo, after three days of, of the liberation of one of the cities, I remember there was this like huge march like of like hundreds and hundreds of children um, dressed like Boy Scouts with a little thing over here. So I asked them, you know, what are they? And they said, they're the Scouts, girls and boys. They're it started with Christians. So they were Christians that they used to be, do um, rehearsal for music and, you know, for Eastern time. But now also a lot of Muslims join. And uh, what are they doing? They all had a little painting thing. And they went and crossed into the safe zone that was just liberated and started painting the, the, the um, how you call it, the way where you walk, the pedestrian walks. Yeah, walkway, yeah, sidewalk. Yeah, the sidewalk. So they were painting black and white and yellow, the sidewalks. They were bringing plants in the middle of the streets and they started putting trees and this after the shelling and they're like all these children and you see the priest over there and i'm talking to him and i'm telling him like, like what are they doing this is like nothing we can't expect the government to rebuild our country alone so we're helping them we are syrian we need to do this and i you can imagine you cry for sadness you cry for happiness you cry for emotion and you go like Oh my God, you are so going to win this war. You're so going to win this war because you deserve it. And then, you know, you talk to the girl. I, I'm going to tell you a very funny story. I have many, but this is one of the funniest stories. So I was interviewing these two students uh, of university. Uh, no, they are going to university. They're 17. So they're going to graduate. And uh, one is Mohammed and the other one is Ahmed. So everybody's name is Mohammed Ahmed after the prophet, right? So we're talking about, you know, and I said, well, is this, I always make this question, even in my live videos, is it true that this is a religious war? And they say, the guy tells me, um, well, no, here in Syria, we don't care about religion. You know, he says, we are, we're bad, we're Syrians. And I go like, yeah, what does that mean? That means we're bad Muslims. And I go, what does that mean? And he says, it means that we hang out with Christians, we hang out with, uh, we don't care, we sometimes drink, sometimes we pray, sometimes we don't pray. We love everybody. And women, they dominate us. They tell us what to do. My mother is the boss. And I say, oh, you're telling me propaganda. I say, you want me to believe these things? He says, no, you know, we really are good friends. We have Christian friends. We have Muslim friends. And they stories. And then he says, yeah, because, you know, for instance, when I go to church with my mother, my mother always, and the guy turns around and he tells him, Ahmed turns to Mohammed and tells him, what do you mean when you go to church? Yeah, yeah, when I go to church with my mom, he says like, what do you mean you go to church with your mom? Your, your mom is Muslim. It's like, no, my dad is Muslim. He says like, yeah, but you're Muslim. I said, no, I'm Christian. And he looks at him and says, so why is your name Mohammed? <laughs> 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 Because my father is Muslim and he put me Muhammad, but my mom is Christian and I go to church and I'm Christian. What is your problem? <laughs> and the guy goes like, no, I'm your best friend. I should know this. It's like, and that for me was the best. Ex and you had to see because they were fighting for like, not fighting, like discussing this issue for nearly four minutes. And I was laughing, saying this crazy that they truly had no idea. And, you know, how um, girls even, you know, they are best friends and one uses a hijab and is covered until here um, with a little scarf. And the other one is showing her belly and her shoulders. And this is Syria. And, uh, you know, I mean, I could tell you so many beautiful stories. 
Um, but I would love for people to actually go into my videos in my Facebook and in yes. my Twitter because I they can see it and they don't have to listen to my stories uh, because uh, uh, this, this man that I, I met, this ex-fighter uh, from the Syrian army, I didn't know he was a fighter. He was in a little kiosk and he broke my heart. He had half of his body and you will never see more dignity and happiness in the face of a person than this man. The, my videos are usually two minutes, uh, max two, two and a half minutes. And my live videos, they can see. I do the live videos, so not, nothing is prepared. Sometimes I'm in the car for five, 10 minutes and then I talk to people and yeah. people. Great. Yeah. Uh, that's a great way to round this out. So many stories and experiences, and for every sad one, there's 30 um, uh, beautiful ones, uh, challenging ones, funny ones. Uh, so how do we how do we find you? I mean, you are all over the place. Do you have some favorite places? Let's get that into the body of the text of this video and make sure people can follow up on all those short videos that will make them more addicted, and they'll see some of your longer videos, which are fantastic as well. Well, uh, they can find me in um, in my Instagram. I don't put as much. There are very nice pictures, but my Instagram, my Twitter is Carla Ortiz O with C, uh, at Carla Ortiz O. And my Facebook is Carla Ortiz Official. It's uh, at Carla Ortiz Official, or just they can just Google Carla Ortiz. It's my fan page. I put sometimes in my, because after I give an interview to One American News, uh, my Facebook fan page, also with 100,000 followers, was uh, blocked. So sometimes I put it in my personal. They can also follow my personal, that is Carla Ortiz Soporto. Uh, but they can see on the videos that are uploaded, um, amazing 2.30 second videos or under it, the rebuilding of uh, a restaurant that was completely in ashes and how they basically put it together uh, they can meet the people, the children, they can meet the women, how they talk, and then they can go, like you said, in the live videos, in all the places I am. And they can even the comments of some of them saying, we're going to kill you, we're going to behead you if you keep on doing the live videos, we know where you are. And I go like, you know, come on. I mean, obviously, and at the beginning, when I got permission from the Ministry of Information, they were very upset with me that I was doing the live videos because I was giving them the location where I was because they said there are still a lot of terrorists around. We don't know who's going to come and stab you and kill you. And um, this was my gift to the world, uh, for them to see what I was living and I was seeing. And I thought nothing can really happen to me because this is something I'm doing for the people to truly see. There's no edit, it's not edited, it is what it is, and they can see it like that. And, uh, or like when I am in the car and there is no security, so I go like 360 with my camera saying, I have no security, nobody's following me, I'm alone with my team, I'm filming peacefully, and they were going like, what? You don't have security, oh my God, you're gonna get killed. Oh. But. This is, this is the beauty of life, and we can give ourselves this gift to do something that later we can look at our children and say, I did something to leave you a better world. Well, you certainly have left a trail of um, impressions behind, and a lot of people have uh, obviously been drawn to you, and some of them have been cut from your feed. I think it's important for us watching this, whoever it might be, Go look up Carla Ortiz, uh, O R T I Z, and uh, Carla with a C, Carla, and um, find her on the Twitter and the, and the YouTube videos. I'll have everything in the body of the text. You can confirm that. I'll send you a copy, uh, Carla, and people can uh, check out, check you out. You know, with all these crazy people uh, in power. Uh, doing what they're doing and then blocking us from talking. We do own the social media still. We need to continue to claim that as our territory. It's so important to keep that and uh, make the internet our territory. And and, and thanks for, for doing that. Um, what what fantastic stories and the the braver that you that you've had is is incredible. 
is there anything else that you want to to talk about, Carla? What what have I left out? We're we're sort of coming to the end. You said you had a half an hour left. That was about a half an hour ago. Thank you for coming mm -hmm. on. Uh, look, I think the most important thing for people to always remember is that a whole hangar where they put um, planes can be in total darkness by just one one little light one match destroys all darkness so don't let anyone make you believe not just that your actions don't have an impact but that you cannot be light because a little bit of light destroys total darkness and total darkness no matter how big it is cannot destroy a little light this is just the way it is and I would like to tell all your followers, the people that are watching this, is never believe what Todd is saying or what I am telling you. After you listen to me and you watch, do your research of everything, whatever news you hear from any country in the world, this is, we need to question ourselves. We are very busy. It is crazy the way we live our lives nowadays. It's very fast, but sometimes it is okay to stop and question even the person that you admire the most because you will be surprised when you truly find the truth. And thank you so much for this space. And uh, I hope I can be finished with my film. Um, I think I'm two months away from finishing editing. I'm gonna be starting uh, also an Indiegogo to uh, um, to get some money to, to finish, uh, you know, to finish properly with the whole post production and everything um but i think and i hope that we can open a little bit the eyes of people with voice of Syria, and hopefully there are going to be many other voices of different countries and other films to come thank you very much last word was with you thank you carl ortiz for the work you've done in this film i really look forward to seeing it i'll, I'll put a I'll, I'll put a review up um for, for that and, and broadcast it as, as much as I can with this little channel and I'm sure many other people will do the same thing. Thank you. I would love I'm gonna be looking forward to see it as well and then we can make a little shorter version of this as well. I send you many blessings to you and all your people. We'll Thank talk soon again. The same. Oh, Thank I'm you. gonna be uploading, sorry, I'm gonna be uploading in the next two weeks four videos that are going to be between four or five minutes of the headquarters of the White House Met. One of them, nobody's been there. And the training center that I have the live videos, but I'm doing the short version. So look up, look, look up to it for the next three days. Everything's going to make so much sense to you. Okay, very good. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day in L.A. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.